This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Upon being sentenced to transportation and sedition in 1848, the Irish nationalist prisoner uh, John Mitchell lamented having been kidnapped and carried off from Dublin in chains as a convicted felon and may never, never more in all Ireland see veil or hill or murmuring stream of rhyme. And Mitchell, to whom I'll return later, um, was surely not alone in experiencing a painful dislocation from his family and his friends upon being transported, but he was one of only a few of the 160,000 or so men, women or children transported to the penal colonies of New South Wales, Van Diemen's Land, um, Norfolk Island and Western Australia between 1788 and 1868. And the, the, one of the relatively few some account of their lives. Um, during the late 1990s and early 2000s there was a concerted effort by historians and literary scholars to rediscover what, what was termed the convict voice um, that is exploring how convicts mediated their experiences of transportation, how their lives can be reconstructed from the records and convict narratives and so on. And doing so is fraught with difficulty. Um, and in this paper I'd like to talk about some of the sources through which the convict voice might be heard. Um, first I'll introduce a few of the official records of the period, um, which were generated in the administration of the various convict systems followed by some of the actual narratives themselves, and I'll end by looking at the narratives of three political transportees, including John Mitchell, as examples of how um, the subject of convict narratives rewrote or, or wrote their own lives. So to begin with, um, some of the official records. Um, the, um, the administration of the convict system in New South Wales and uh, Van Diemen's Land generated vast quantities of de hugely detailed records through which the authorities sought to know and control the prisoners. So by way of example, the, the Van Demonian conduct records are an almost unparalleled corpus of uh, information about the lives of largely working class people in, from the 19th century. When a convict arrived in Van Diemen's Land aboard a transport ship, a representative from the convict department went on board and interviewed them at great length and recorded as much information as was possible. So this process was designed to get as complete a physical picture as possible of the prisoners, so it includes their eye colour, their hair colour and other distinguishing features like uh, scars and tattoos. And it also had to ascertain their character and the skills which they brought to the colony to ensure that their labour was usefully directed. In addition, the records contain details of their movement around the colony, uh, to whom the convict was assigned, various punishments inflicted upon them, and, and so on. And they were a, a central reference point for colonial administrators to ensure that deserving individuals were rewarded and that those requiring punishment were um, duly treated. So, And it's little wonder that this system, so detailed as it was, has been called the paper panopticon. Um, which the authorities believed would um, ensure that the convicts would never outwit the eye of authority at any point. So, for instance, if a convict absconded, then this information would be used to um, create a notice that would be put in the government gazette in order to facilitate their apprehension. Though these records are very much a creation of the convict's captors or a, a view from above, as it were, they do occasionally offer a glimpse of the convict voice through which it is possible to discern and or reconstruct aspects of uh, convict lives. And this can be most usefully seen in this section here at the top, um, generally described as a section called Stated This Offence. So as part of the interview process, the convict department asked the prisoners why they had been transported, um, and the prisoner gives their statement um, and it's compared against the indents transmitted from London um, on the transport ship um, just to ensure there was uh, it was accurate. There was some room for creativity um, one clerk clearly wasn't concentrating when he recorded the convict James Porter uh, as having asserted that he was a beer machine maker um, but the prisoners largely assumed that the authorities knew um, about their past lives and told generally something approaching the truth so the, the stated this offence section contains both the official reason for the, the convict's transportation as well as the prisoner's sometimes much more expansive and revealing explanation uh, for what was going on. 
The prisoner might, for instance, say why they committed the crime, try and explain the context in which it occurred, talk about any accomplices they may have had, as well as talking about any family they may have left behind when they were transported. So in a study of African and African diaspora transportees, the historian Ian Duffield um, describes these statements as high-density convict micro-narratives which subvert the official records and, as he puts it, the very zeal to compel humiliating confessions from convicts backfired. Um, so by way of example, he points to this um, record of a convict simply named Maria, in brackets after her name is uh, a slave, and she had been transported for murder in 1825, as the record states, but her own statement stridently uh, challenges that stark explanation. She was a, a slave um, convicted in Honduras, seems to have been working for one William Mayer, a builder, and she states, I was beat by him and he got a knife. We scuffled together and in the scuffle the knife entered his body and killed him. So while Maria's explanation suggests that Mayer's death was an accident, it's, it does seem quite unapologetic about the uh, circumstances. Um, another example here, uh, jo Private Joseph Graham of the 42nd Regiment. Uh, he was stationed in Malta when on the 3rd of October 1844 he was transported for life for drunken mutinous conduct. Graham stated that he had struck his major when he was in what he called the horrors and it's unclear whether or not he meant he was drunk or suffering from some sort of psychological malady. Either way, he clearly had little time for authority, as it states here in the uh, Distinguishing Marks section. This is Marks of Punishment. So presumably he uh, rebelled against military discipline quite frequently. Um, here is the record of Patrick Murphy. He was convicted of vagrancy uh, in Wicklow in Ireland in July 1844, but still considered himself the agent of his own fate. His statement reads, I was laying about the streets, but went to the police and told them I should like to be transported, and his wish was granted. And just as a final example of these sort of records, this is um, a man simply called Harry. Um, a number of Aboriginal men were caught up in the convict system from about the 1840s onwards. Um, as convict, as um, this is generally frontier conflict, conflict between uh, settlers and uh, uh, indigenous Australians, and they found themselves caught up in the convict system. So Harry was just the, the name given to him by the legal system. He had been convicted in 1846 and sent to Norfolk Island for assaulting a stock keep, stock keeper with intent to um, murder. Um, Harry's explanation, however, was much more revealing. He simply stated that he had been attacking the white men. Um, so I could continue at length with these sort of examples which are by turn illuminating and revealing in that they let us hear the convict voice, however briefly, and hear convicts speak for themselves. But these statements are mediated through the convict department and the su their superiors, and by and large they deal with offending behaviour and a specific moment in time. And moreover, as Maria's case indicates, we can generally speculate or infer the context in which these events occurred, but little more than that without recourse to uh, other complementary sources. So it's in the, the relatively rare convict narratives and memoirs themselves which we see the, the fullest description of convict lives before, during and after uh, transportation. Convict narratives themselves are um, a subtype of the ever popular criminal biography of the 18th and 19th century and the convict narratives themselves typically fall into two main types. The, the first and most common are the ones which were published in the 18th and 19th centuries during or around the period in which convicts were actually transported to Australia and more often than not they were subjected to some degree of intervention by either an editor, a publisher or some other sort of amanuensis. So the ex-convict James Lester Burke um, edit ghost wrote uh, these two of the most famous and widely read uh, convict narratives, Martin Cash's Bush Ranger of Van Diemen's Land and Mark Jeffrey's A Burglar's Life, both of which went into multiple editions. <coughs> um, and it's really a testament to Burke's skill as both books are conversation and quite racy but not altogether uh, conversant with the truth. Excuse me. Um, Published convict narratives were um, 
according to Anne Conlon in her study of those published between 1815 and 1850, variations of the moral tale, a device which, through the influence of e evangelical thought, the growth of the popular press, and of middle-class concepts of the best way to educate the masses, was becoming very popular in the 19th century. So ostensibly, convict narratives were meant to warn the lower orders of the consequences of immorality, irreligion, and drink quite frequently, but far more commonly were experienced by their audiences as entertainment. The, the published narratives had a general structure. The, the author is almost always male, and the convict falls into drinking or bad company, womanising and other <coughs> disreputable behaviour, much to the shame of his respectable parents. He is then transported and embarks upon a series of adventures in the penal colonies, usually seeing um, rather than experiencing the, the worst aspects of the convict system for himself. And he emerges penitent with his selfhood intact and tells his tale as a warning to others not to repeat his mistakes. And as a result of um, trying to prove the, the reformation of the subject and at the same time trying to sell copies, there's often a tension um, of this, trying to demonstrate this reformation while also offering some form of uh, moral titillation about flogging and punishment and so on. And so hence, almost all of the narratives um, this describe flogging, but the narrative subject himself never usually experiences the lash himself. And the publisher of this narrative, the, the Fell Tyrant, the, the narrative of one William Ross, was perhaps the most commercially cynical. Um, it concludes with a quite a lengthy section about conditions at the Norfolk Island penal station, which was then the most notorious penal station in the English-speaking world. However, this, this section is almost entirely an invention. Um, it was the, this narrative was first published in 1836, but Ross wasn't actually sent to Norfolk Island until 1838, so it's really a case of uh, life imitating art for William Ross, who's rather unfortunate. Typically, the authors of the published narratives are quite vague about the circumstances of, their, of what got them transported. Um, Joseph Platt, in his horrors of transportation, simply stated that he had the, what he calls the misfortune of being transported for 14 years in April 1834, but doesn't expand any further. More commonly, the blame is ascribed to what is usually known as bad company or, or drink. And as, as Anne Conlon notes again, um, when the authors of these narratives in stress the influence of bad companions as an explanation for their becoming criminal, she describes this as it, them indicating a desire to blame society rather than their own misuse of free will for what had happened to them. <coughs> so though William Ross, in his narrative, he's quite expansive about <coughs> his early life and his crime and what got him transported, um, but his claims are so fantastical that it just makes it all the less believable. He claimed that his father was a, what he called an opulent merchant in Antigua, that his mother was the daughter of a wealthy gentleman. After his mother's death, um, father and son travelled to England for the sake of William's education. Uh, Ross then describes romancing noble women, marrying the niece of a, a, what he calls a gallant admiral, and a successful career as a London merchant. He um, then, however, talks about how he became dissipated and spending beyond his means. In an unfortunate hour where I applied a large sum of money belonging to my person in Cheapside to my own uses for which I was tried and sentenced to transportation for seven years. And this is sort of seemingly um, deliberately vague. Um, as the modern day editors of um, his narrative point out, uh, Ross was in fact convicted at the Old Bailey in February 1818 for stealing uh, a silver spoon, though he doesn't actually appear to have been transported on this occasion. And he cl Ross claimed in mitigation that he, is, uh, he was drunk as uh, reason. It was only um, in 1826 when he was actually transported for what, what, what he described in the narrat his narrative as a little bit of trouble. But he, uh, the court records again show that he was transported on this occasion for stealing a silver spoon again. And again he protested that he was drunk, despite the arresting constable suggesting that um, this was in fact a pretense. Um, the story of a convict called James Pont Borrett was ghostwritten by the Reverend H. J. Hatch with, uh, with Borrett thinly disguised as uh, a convict called James Thrale. Because it's written by a clergyman, it very much talks about the... Um, concentrates on the reformation of the individual and how he endured um, the, the convict colonies. 
according to Hatch, Boyd was born to quite a, a respectable family, um, desiring of giving his son quite a, a good education. However, Boyd's father died when he was young. His mother remarried, and he fell out with his mother and his stepfather, and went away to work at sea. And it was on being paid off and coming back to London with a pocket full of cash that um, Boyd found himself falling in with a bunch of evil men and falling into habits of intoxication, as he described it. On the uh, final carouse, the night before setting out to sea again, Boritt, with a group of men, drunkenly broke into a shop in the East End, though the trial record does suggest it was rather a, a well-planned job. Boritt was transported for 15 years, lamenting, and I quote, he had, that he had destroyed his whole life solely by his having given way to the questionable pleasure of drink. So if the authors of published narratives are vague about the circumstances of their being transported, they're actually far more um, forthcoming about their experiences in the colony itself. Endurance and suffering, even if they did not directly experience these conditions themselves, were really the, the key themes of the narratives. Just a small map there of some of the places I'll talk about. At the, the Morton Bay penal settlement, so modern, modern day Brisbane is where uh, Morton Bay was. William Ross wrote of how he was struck with amazement and horror. The convicts' countenances bespoke starvation and their bodies bore marks, evidently of a most severe flogging. They were exposed to a hot and scorching sun without a rag to cover their nakedness, and at night they were mustered in a cave. And it's notable that Ross con consistently refers to the convicts of Morton Bay is they rather than we. He doesn't identify himself specifically with them. And while Ross did do some hard labour at Morton Bay, he was also appointed as a constable, so he had a degree of power um, re as in relation to the other prisoners and, and a degree of comfort that that afforded him. Even so, Ross described being um, altogether um, bewildered as to whether God had forgotten me as the prisoners struggled along under the weight of 20 pound irons and maimed themselves in order to avoid backbreaking work. But it's in these um, descriptions of vicarious suffering which appears to have been a tactic for many of the, the authors of published narratives. Flogging is often vividly described but it was not the authors themselves who actually endured it. Um, so hence the convict John Mortlock was not flogged but the men in the barrack yard under the window where he um, slept were, and as he described it, the horrid sound of the cats, the cat of nine tails, upon naked flesh like the crack of a cart whip tortured my ears. So Mortlock never felt the lash, but remained man enough to be repulsed by the, the sight and sound of it. And the authors of the published narratives do appear to have acted as a guide to, the, to their readers um, through a sort of picaresque of antipathy and horror. Um, though transported criminals, men like Mortlock and Ross, retained enough sensibility to be appalled by this, this brutal punishment. However, a minority of the, the subjects of published narratives did describe their experience of the lash. The, uh, the convict, writing under the pseudonym of Jack Bushman, commented upon how glibly one can say 100 lashes they were not comfortable to take, I can assure you. Um, Mark Jeffrey's life was, uh, as he described it, was defined by punishment and his resistance to it. And he described receiving 50 lashes um, administered by a flogger who hated his job, so the, the punishment barely scratched his skin. Um, and in a narrative brimming with bravado, the subtext here is that Jeffrey was far too tough for even a cat of nine tails to draw his blood. Joseph Platt, upon the other hand, was extremely explicit about the suffering he endured, though it was more a commentary upon the brutality of those in power over him. His inhuman master, as he described him, one Thomas Dunstan, brought him before the magistrates on several occasions, um, for which he received about 500 lashes in just under three years. Convict life for Platt was a litany of abuses. Um, he ran from his <coughs> master, who had had him flogged so much, but he was returned, flogged again, and sentenced to wear irons for three years. For six years at Cockatoo Island followed, then a stretch at Norfolk Island where his suffering was amplified. He slept in what he described as a tiny bunk alive with vermin, surrounded by the oaths, imprecations and obscenity of his wretched companions, and between these sounds, the darkness of the den, it was truly an earthly hell. Yet Platt emerged, as the strictures of the moral parable genre demanded, reformed and unwilling to countenance crime ever again. 
His narrative ends with him returning to England, penniless but penitent, and his parents having died since he was transported, and stating, I now publish this book, hoping that every parent's child will take a warning by this my sad fate. And other prisoners um, profess to be similarly, similarly reformed. Just to return to uh, Mr. Bart. Despite languishing at Norfolk Island with all its horrors and escaping uh, from there back to England via New Caledonia before being retransported to Norfolk Island after being identified, James Punt Barrett, according to his ghostwriter, still retained enough goodness and wisdom enough to perceive that his best plan would be to conduct himself civilly and endeavouring by good conduct to secure the goodwill of all with whom he should come in contact. In the conclusion to his narrative, Mark Jeffrey managed to be both simultaneously penitent and unrepentant. On one hand, he reflected upon what he called the vistas of vice and crime, in the haunts of which my manhood has been wasted, and my soul is torn by the most poignant regrets. On the other hand, he insisted that all the violence which he had visited upon others had been justified. He says that he only hurt those who acted towards me, as if I was some unnamed wild beast of the field. Even so, Geoffrey sensed some unseen influence which had guided me through, and which is surely leading me out of this wilderness of sin into a heaven of perpetual rest and peace. And even the, the convict writing under the pseudonym of Thomas Jones, ground down by torture and brutality until he had committed murder, wept quietly in his condemned cell at the end of his narrative, hand in hand with his priest, and accepted the word of God. It's the, the second type of convict narrative which is perhaps the most interesting. Um, these narratives typically only exist in manuscript and have either not been published or were only recently published by uh, modern day editors. The manuscripts are often seem to be in the hand of the, the author. Um, they have the scope to be far more subversive in tone and graphic in nature than the published narratives um, because they don't necessarily have to conform to the, the strictures of the, the, the convict narrative genre. But for all that, there is still some conformity to the, the familiar tropes. So this, the, the Diary of John Ward, a manuscript of the National Library of Australia and Canada, um, details his fall into debauchery, his transportation and his ultimate reformation and repentance. And it's in the, the crucible of Norfolk Island where Ward undergoes what seems to be quite a fervent religious conversion. Um, according to Ward, the, the Bible awakened me to a sense of the danger I was in and brought me to my heavenly father's footstool at last. And the, remit, the final uh, few pages of the diary is taken up with Ward's attendances at religious services, commentaries upon um, sermons and his suffering from dysentery. And his, one of the final entries for the 25th of April 1843 is quite gnomic. Um, it simply reads, Let my life preach of the, testament, or the testimonies of my pen, or lips will be entirely useless. Dunghills when raked stink the most. Ointments when rubbed smell the sweetest. So I'm not still trying to work out quite what he's saying there. Um, the manuscript narrative of a man, of a man simply called Daniel um, is almost entirely in the style of the, the typical published convict account, despite being a manuscript. Daniel has an early respectable life that gives way again to debauchery in London and Paris. He um, tells his readers that they will not be surprised that I should run into excesses, in, particularly in Paris, where he describes how he visited every place of amusement, heard the vocal powers of Madame Cataline, uh, took excursions to Versailles, saint claude Saint-Denis, and saw Marshal Ney being executed. In, back in London, he formed an attachment with a beautiful girl residing in Fitzroy Square, one who moved in the higher and more elevated circles of libertinism. To her, I certainly most attribute my downfall. And it's this sort of self-absolution from blame, which could have come from any number of the published criminal biographies. Um, just spin on ahead to a few of the slightly out of order. Um, as Emmanuel said, as in, in further, we at UCL actually have the very first um, Australian convict narrative in our in UCL special collections among the papers of the philosopher and reformer Jeremy Bentham. So among this this vast collection of 60,000 folios or so is this 23 page document called the Memorandums of James Martin and it's a, an account of perhaps the, the most famous uh, escape from Australia by transported prisoners. About 10pm on the 28th of March 1791 
eight male prisoners, one female convict and her two infant children um, stole the, the governor's six oared boat, absconded from Sydney Harbour and sailed out into the Pacific. Um, and this is the route that they, they took. They sailed up and along the eastern and northern coasts of Australia, um, reached Dutch controlled West Timor on the 5th of June, so in just over two months. They, there they passed themselves off as the survivors of a shipwreck. Um, until they were identified, gave themselves away, and they were returned to England as escaped prisoners. And it's an astonishing um, feat surviving this 5,000 kilometer journey in an open boat, exposed to the elements. Um, they'd drowned on a number of occasions. It, the memor the um, narrative itself is quite matter of fact. It's it, written in three distinct hands. It appears to be three of the surviving convicts when they were held in Newgate Jail after being returned to, to London. Um, it's quite matter of fact in tone. It really just describes the various places they stopped off at, their interactions with Aboriginal Australians and Torres Strait Islanders, and being particularly in the Gulf of Carpentaria where they were chased by Torres Strait Islanders and just about escaped. Um, the only real, <coughs> excuse me, um, emotion which comes through is when they were um, facing very very heavy weather so on but the 9th of May 1791 the the author writes of how they were driven out to sea by a gale with the sea running mountains high thinking every moment to be the last the sea coming in so heavy upon us I will leave you to consider what distress we must be in the woman and the two little babies was in a bad condition and as a brief bit of self-promotion um, I edited and we published an edition of the memorandums on the Bentham Project website so this is now available to, to download and read and it's linked to the original manuscript images themselves for, for anybody who might want to take a look. So let's take a spin back. Um, the, the manuscript narratives do dwell in great detail upon punishments, even more so than the, the published narratives and in often far more detail. Uh, graphic detail quite frequently. So for instance a manuscript called The Demon um, it's the work of a, an author called Henry Beresford Garrett describing his time at Norfolk Island between 1846 and 1853. Uh, Garrett's real name was, was Henry Rouse. The, the Demon uh, was written three decades after the events it describes so you just have to take into that, that into account um, the thing you have to take into account the most is that Garrett said he was writing after being inspired by Marcus Clarke's superb convict novel, His Natural Life, um, which was published in 1874. And Clarke's book is the story of a prisoner called Rufus Dawes, a man wrongfully transported who endures the worst the convict system can throw at him with almost Christ-like stoicism. And though fiction, His Natural Life has had a huge influence upon popular perceptions of the convict system. Um, even even to this day, and several characters are based upon real historical characters, uh, not least the tyrannical Maurice Freyer, uh, the Commandant of Norfolk Island, who is based upon one of the real Commandants of Norfolk Island, uh, John Giles Price. Garrett, um, in writing The Demon, says that he thought Clark had deliberately toned down Price's behaviour so as not to horrify his readers, and the demon was then Garrett's attempt at his re revenge upon Price, um, though he was never actually punished at Norfolk Island himself, and to set the record straight as he saw it. He begins with an attempt at false humility. I am compelled to write the truth, even though society has not always told the truth about myself, an attempt to gain the trust of his readers. But this claim is rather undermined in the next sentence, where he says that it was enmity, not friendship, which tips my pen. And indeed, the demon is a sustained attack upon Price, um, who he describes as the great boss villain. Some, by words of wisdom or acts of benevolence, Garrett writes, acquire immortality and are embalmed in the hearts of future generations, while others, by their huge crimes, are remembered with execration and stink in the nostrils of, nostrils of posterity. John Price was one of the latter of almost worldwide infamy. So for Garrett, Price's Norfolk Island was a, a living hell, and he appears to try and outdo himself in making each description more vivid and repulsive than the last. So he talks of men's backs being ragged and bruised from the lash, bakes in the sun like crackly pork, 
while those sick with dysentery were smothered with flies and maggots, weak from disease, starvation and punishment, how they staggered to and from labour until no longer to do so, they laid down and died or committed suicide. However, the demon as a source is wildly untrustworthy. Um, Garrett's apparent eagerness to ensure Price's infamy led him to simply make things up. So he talks about um, something called a punishment yard, which never actually existed, um, and wildly ex exaggerates the extent of flogging. So in The Demon, Garrett states that the daily amount of lashes given under, this, under Price averaged 3,000. So the one thing the British Empire was very good at was counting, um, and the infliction of corporal punishment was uh, measured in awful detail. And it, if you go through the records and work everything out, the, the average number of lashes inflicted every day during Price's time at Norfolk Island was in fact 16, so rather, rather less um, than Garrett was, was suggesting. Writing in a, a similar vein to Garrett, though uh, several decades earlier, was the Irishman Lawrence Frame. Frame was aged 17 when he was transported to New South Wales in 1826 for stealing a bit of rope. Um, he continued offending in the colony. Um, in June 1830 he was convicted of stealing in a dwelling house and putting in fear, which was a synonym for bush ranging, uh, so escaped convicts rampaging around the, the countryside in New South Wales um, and was sent to Norfolk Island for life. Frayne's narrative is um, probably the most remarkable um, convict narrative I've come across. It's not merely a catalogue of suffering or a, an attack upon his apparent tormentor, Commandant James Morissette, though it's certainly both those things. Um, among the bursts of invective is a subtle and quite a thoughtful treatise upon the nature of good and moral governance and how um, prisoners could be elevated, as Frayne describes it, um, to the standard of men once more. <coughs> but suffer, Frayne certainly did. He endured a staggering uh, 1,125 lashes between July 1831 and November 1832. The first hundred came on the 30th of July 1831 for disobeying and threatening his overseer. However, um, he, another hundred was added to that total when in court Frayne stood up and decried the commandant um, as what Frayne called him as great a tyrant as Nero ever was. After the flogging, the witnessing superintendent who took him down from the, the flogging triangle swore that I was a brickmaker, meaning that I was like an iron man past all feeling of the punishment. Alas, Frayne continued, I had felt too acutely the full weight and sting of every flash, but he retained his masculinity and self-respect by refusing to give his tormentors the satisfaction of hearing him scream. And he was given some comfort by the fact that despite subsequent floggings, his flesh, as he described it, remained defiantly and perfectly sound, but this comfort was, was rather slight. If I might afterwards be made emperor of all the universe, Frayne wrote, no heart can conceive or can write or tongue can tell the poignant grief and the anguish of the sort I have suffered both mental and otherwise. In uh, 1840, um, a naval officer called Alexander McConaughey was appointed as superintendent at Norfolk Island um, and he instituted a series of innovations which gave the prisoners an, in an interest in their own reformation and behaviour and, and their work. It allowed them to ease their condition and potentially shorten their detention at Norfolk Island by carrying out their, their work so they would be paid a, um, a wage as it were for, this <coughs> for a certain amount of work carried out and this would go towards a total number of uh, marks as McConaughey called them and if the prisoner earned 6,000 marks in a couple of years they could be released from their seven year sentence um, more quickly than they otherwise might have been. Um, McConaughey also appears to have encouraged convicts to write about their lives or at least at the very least given them tacit encouragement to frame um, amongst them and it's upon this topic that Frayne's narrative becomes even more interesting. Um, long sections of it compare the treatment of prisoners under McConaughey's uh, godlike system, as he called it, with that of the former commandants. So there was, Frayne believed, and no doubt drawing on rather bitter experience, a certain pitch to which you can work upon man to bring him to fear and regard his superiors and his god, but exceed that and you begin to make him reckless, 
he at once throws off all restraints in regard for either God or man. So when the authorities simply chose to impose their will um, upon prisoners, as, as Frey in sight, no good could come of it. And the um, the narrative of a prisoner called William Westwood um, would no doubt of uh, no doubt Frey would have thought illustrated his point perfectly. In his narrative. Westwood freely admitted murdering four men, for which, which he later hanged, but stated that he had injured no one willingly, that had not by repeated wanton injustice called down on the vengeance of heaven, that I and others was the instruments that God employed to execute it. So Westwood, Westwood's self-appointment as God's executioner is rather remarkable, as was his positing this idea of him, um, of a sort of justified resistance for convicts, that... Um, persecution could be legitimately um, met with violence. Such reasoning, however, did not prevent his execution, and uh, the autobiography ends simply by stating, I now bid the world adieu and all it contains. And a number of other men wrote uh, manuscript narratives with McCon at least McConaughey's tacit approval, um, the most de detailed of which was probably the, the narrative of Thomas Cook, entitled The Exile's Lamentations. Um, it's sort of a picaresque of horror through the road gangs of New South Wales, prison hulks in Sydney Harbour, um, and, and Norfolk Island itself. And like Frey and Cook found that the old system of discipline proved that, uh, as he called it, human nature could not long patiently endure such a dreadful state of suffering, and so treated men as a natural result became desperate, and in all their passions and actions were very devils. So the... Um, treatment being meted out by the authorities was actually corroding prisoners rather than reforming them. However, as uh, Cook thought, McConaughey changed all that. Um, from his, he gave a speech to the convicts as soon as he landed, and um, Cook describes this as having drawn tears from the eyes of the most hardened and depraved beings. And his account of McConaughey's Norfolk Island is glowing and almost barely believable. He writes that convicts all appear to labour cheerfully in the one large field of reformation, not mentioning that he later became one of McConaughey's most trusted convict lieutenants. Cook's account of Norfolk Island is rather dubious. Um, for instance, he describes a major riot um, there in 1834, despite not himself not actually arriving until two years later. So manuscript narratives might appear to provide us with an apparently more authentic convict voice, uh, than published accounts on the grounds that they not necessarily have been touched by an editor, but they must, as Cook's narrative might suggest, still be questioned for accuracy and context. Their authors do not, having um, written not necessarily with publication in mind, they don't necessarily have to have met the, the tropes of the, the convict narrative genre, um, and they do have a little more freedom with which to write, but don't se seem to have been fully able to throw off the shackles of the genre and the shackles of convention. But there is one more uh, subset of convict narratives to which I'll turn finally, uh, which not only ignores the various tropes of the, the genre, but actively subverts them. Um, so I'd like to end by briefly discussing the accounts of individuals transported for explicitly political offences. Though political transportees comprise comprised a tiny percentage of all the um, people transported to Australia. Their experiences are atypical in comparison to the majority of convicts, but they did write collectively um, a great number of narratives about their experiences in the colony, um, which have gathered a great deal of attention and influence, though we must be very careful not to draw too many conclusions about convict life from their very um, specific experiences. And in some respects, works by political transportees might even be more of a performance um, than typical convict narratives, examples of what Foucault describes as being when one writes in order to become other than what one is. Political prisoners are constantly seeking to persuade their audience that they were not criminals, that they had been persecuted by British injustice, and that it was only the righteousness of their cause that ensured they survived their experience. So, for instance, so keen was he to persuade his audience, um, the chartist John Frost went on a speaking tour of England after returning from Van Diemen's Land to promote his narrative, The Horrors of Convict Life, and he used to go up on stage with 
um, allegedly authentic chains and cats of nine tails to to illustrate to his horrified audience the sort of conditions he endured. But these narratives don't have to meet the criminal biography's standard features. There's no need for political transportees to hide or obscure their crime when it was to them a virtue or what John Mitchell called his pious felony. And there's no need to exhibit penitence for a cause that was honourable and just. So to illustrate these issues, I'd like to briefly discuss the narratives of three prisoners, um, John Mitchell, um, Linus Miller and Francois Xavier Prieur. Um, their narratives quite neatly um, illustrate these issues. So firstly to return to John Mitchell. Um, when Mitchell described himself as a convicted felon, he did so ironically um, in an attempt to identify himself with his audience, garner their sympathy and draw a clear and present distinction between himself, um, an honourable and politically motivated exile, and the other sort of general mass of criminals who'd been transported to Van Diemen's land. <laughs> he was transported in 14 years in 1848 for st stirring up sedition before the, the Young Island Rising of that year. He was first sent to the penal colony of Bermuda and subsequently Van Diemen's Land, where he arrived in April 1850, aged 34. And it's worth noting that for all his um, complaints about the lack of freedom in Ireland, um, after he escaped Van Diemen's Land to the United States, um, he sided with the southern states during the Civil War and edited a newspaper, and he was a powerful advocate for slavery and um, wrote lots of editorials about the, uh, the uh, benefits of slavery and even proposed the reopening of the transatlantic slave trade, <coughs> learning nothing from his own experiences. Uh, Linus Miller was a 21-year-old law clerk from New York State. He was one of 92 so-called patriot exiles um, who embarked upon cross-border raids into Upper Canada um, during June to December 1838, hoping to spark a rebellion and liberate um, what he thought were oppressed Canadians from British rule. Miller, in his narrative, um, portrays himself as something of an all-action hero, but this uh, is rather a fantasy. As the historian Cassandra Pybus notes, Miller actually pleaded not guilty at his trial on grounds of temporary insanity, and other witnesses at his trial describe him as quite a fanciful daydreamer. And finally, is Francois Xavier Prieur, um, who was transported aged 24. He was a shopkeeper who commanded the men of the Saint Timothy uh, region, or village rather, during the, the Lower Canadian Rebellion of 1838, uh, for which 58 uh, Canadiens were transported to New South Wales in 1839. And this rebellion originated in the confrontation between the French speaking Catholic majority who made their livelihoods through largely near subsistence farming and the English speaking minority who controlled the offices of state and who appeared to be eroding Canadian traditions. The rebellion was led by Republican spirited politicians but was actually comprised largely of tenant farmers and was, was quickly suppressed. <coughs> so, as I, I suggested, all three men took care to ensure that their readers understood that they were very different from real convicts, as it were. In the first instance, they exhibit pronounced offence at being placed in proximity with, uh, with criminals. Prieur and his, pri and his fellows were mortified at having their clothing branded like cattle with the, the broad arrow, um, the sign of the, the government. Um, and as Prieur put it, this applied the finishing touch to the process of classing us with convicts. Miller's sensibilities were similarly outraged at being forced to associate with the prisoners of Port Arthur in Van Diemen's Land what he called the refuse and scum of mankind. And all three had, like Henry Savory's um, eponymous hero in the first Australian novel, Quintus Servington, found themselves enrolled among burglars, highwaymen and other criminals in the one sweeping comprehensive term, convict. And despite, or perhaps because of this attempted disassociation, political prisoners exhibit little in the way of empathy for their fellow transportees. Um, Mitchell describes his convict servants, fellow Irishmen no less, as horrible cutthroats and convicts in general as a mass of incarnate burglary, thievery and corruption, partly in order to emphasise his own social standing 
and to illustrate how persecuted he was by being made to associate with, uh, with these individuals. Mitchell um, represented Van Diemen's Land as a netherworld in which he was cursed to spend years with beings in human shape. <coughs> so this is one of the, one of the more um, evocative passages. Oh, I descend into the realms of Dis, my ears hear already the Coxitus flood and the wailing of damned spirits thereon, O oh, my soul, towards the grand enemy, the grand government necromancer who keeps those gardens of hell, let my face be as marble, my heart as adamant, so may almighty God preserve me in my human shape, and my infernal pilgrimage is done. And Mil um, Mitchell's narrative, the jail journal, is, is full of these sort of flourishes, it's beautifully written rich in classical illusion and rather ostentatiously emphasising his education and the social divide between him and other transportees. So as Mitchell describes, Van Demonian society was begotten in felony. It was a poisonous uh, simulacrum of the, the old world transplanted into the new. It was what he described as a small, misshapen, transported bastard England. So while the, the narratives of political transportees not only suggest that they were socially superior, they also infer that even their suffering was of a more profound nature than um, that of other convicts. Mitchell writes of being so tormented that he contemplated suicide, but he concluded that death at his own hands would make him a conspirator with the British cabinet and prove that England's brute power is resistless. Mitchell thought that sometimes to suffer manfully is the best thing man can do and it was simply by surviving and ensuring that his cause was not forgotten that he would have his victory. And Mitchell complains bitterly about restrictions put upon his movement but he in fact received a lot of preferential treatment in Van Diemen's land. Um, Earl Grey, the Secretary of State for the Colonies, ordered um, the Lieutenant Governor of Van Diemen's land, William Dennison, to give Mitchell a ticket of leave upon his arrival and this allowed him to travel around and move um, within a particular police district of his own, own free will and take care, as he put it, that Mitchell be subjected to no restraint on the part of the government which may not be necessary to prevent his leaving Van Diemen's land. So Mitchell never did hard labour, he never slept in a convict barracks, he never went anywhere near a chain gang or a penal settlement and instead his family were allowed out to live with him. He was given a farm of 200 acres, convict servants, good horses and he lived a sedentary lifestyle um, more associated with that with a country squire than a transported convict. <coughs> Mitchell even had his friend, the fellow Irish political transportee Kevin O'Doherty over for what he called a great evening or two, pipes, chat, song, nobblers, yea tumblers of drink. So complaints about severity of punishment and struggle suddenly ring a little hollow um, when this sort of thing becomes clear. And in just, although Mitchell does try and justify his having accepted what was essentially um, house arrest, he says that he would have preferred to have been put upon an equal footing with genuine convicts because he could then have attempted escape. He would signed a parole agreement which gave him the ticket of leave um, and so absconding after having signed this parole, parole rather, would have sullied his honour and ensured that the convict system had corrupted him too. Miller's arrival in Hobart um, likewise tested his fortitude. While soldiers and uh, free settlers would have welcomed the, the sight of the land after uh, such a long journey, um, for Miller, landfall was no comfort <coughs> to any convict. Does his heart leap for joy as the iron-bound coast become visible? Great God, see the hopeless glance of his eye towards his future home. All that the heart could love and cherish is left behind. Hope lingers on the visions of the past, but the future, its dark and cruel uncertainty, the years of hopeless misery and woe, shame, degradation and death, haunt his gloomy spirit, and he bitterly curses the land, the land. So, uh, for Miller, the welcome from Lieutenant Governor John Franklin hardly lightened the mood. No words of kindness fell from his lips, no wonder then if they gave up all for lost and turned away to wallow in the mire of crime and hopeless depravity. And Franklin's harangues seemed almost designed to convince the men of their worthlessness, uh, according to Miller. And he concluded that Van Diemen's land was a place where there is no Sabbath, no Bible, no God. We are held as slaves and required to do the bidding of a depraved wretch 
against God and religion. And Miller was most tormented by, as he called it, the realisation that he was both an American citizen and a British slave. Uh, Franklin warned Miller that Van Diemen's land is not America and the, the birthright of liberty and equality should remain in his breast. Miller found it particularly ironic that he was being told this by a nephew of our immortal uh, Benjamin Franklin. And Miller painted Franklin, Britain's representative, as a sort of fat, effect, windbag, uh, what he called an old granny, paling in comparison to the manly, imprisoned American patriots. But for all his talk of tyranny and the implied need to resist it, Miller's conduct record is largely empty. Uh, he was sentenced, admittedly, to two years hard labour at Port Arthur in September 1840 for absconding, but even there he, he got off fairly lightly. Um, his narrative dwells upon the hard labour to which he was initially put to, but um, he largely worked as a gardener, a church clerk and a school teacher while he was there, uh, rather than in one of the work gangs. And Mitchell's conduct record was similarly quiet. Um, he was only pulled up once and discharged without punishment in May 1851 for leaving his district without a pass. Prieur um, appeared to have been the least overtly politically motivated of the three. Uh, he focused upon the, the endurance of the Canadiens as a, a group and the persistence of their self-respect <coughs> in the face of humiliation. So even on the transport ship Buffalo, which took them from Canada to New South Wales, um, the military guard upon, aboard the boat amused themselves by goading them um, and the prisoners were fed from buckets, they were crippled by seasickness and crammed in below decks um, for most of the journey. In New South Wales they were sent to a um, stockade called Longbottom on the, the Parramatta River, slightly inland, under a superintendent who Prior described as a coarse, brutal man whose manners were detestable and whose temper almost as uncontrollable as uncontrolled. And Prior implies that they only survived largely through sheer force of will until eventually their pardons arrived. By August 1844 many of them had left for home but Prior was left behind as he didn't have the, the means to travel home and the government um, didn't provide any money to do so. He whiled away, he whiled away Sundays on a su uh, look overlooking Sydney Harbour, sat on a cliff and pining for Canada and his lamentation as he describes it is particularly affecting um, and emblematic of the suffering of an exiled political transportee. Excuse me. My eyes were watching the wake of the ship which had carried away my lucky comrades. My thoughts accompanied this ship, with it I ranged the seas, the parish where I was born, then my mother's kisses, the joy of my old father, the hand clasps of my friends passed through my mind, only to surrender me very soon to the harsh reality which made me find myself once again upon the wretched rock of the land of my exile. Then I was overcome with the anguish of unhappiness, during which I cried out ceaselessly, when or when shall I be able to set out for Canada? It must have seemed particularly perverse to Prieur that despite now having his pardon and becoming free, that he was still exiled for his home for, for even longer. Happily, he did finally return home in 1846. So just to um, conclude, um, Mitchell's experience of British prisons around the globe, around the globe rather, formulated his view, uh, he, as he called it, that on British felony the sun never sets, subverting Britain's imperial pride for his own rhetorical ends. So, despite their first appearance, despite their first appearance, the uh, narratives of political transportees are in fact moral, moral parables of a, of a fashion, though not strictly in the the format of the published convict narratives discussed earlier, in which the, the penitent convict atones for his crime. For a political prisoner, the narrative was a lesson in how the heroic protagonist was persecuted, but in which their survival was a blow against the enemy, their own little victory against their persecutors. While political prisoners were writing with a political purpose in mind, the authors of more typical um, convict narratives were simply attempting to tell the story of their lives or at least the story which they, uh, they wanted to have remembered. And for those of us researching convict history, um, convict narratives are amongst the most fascinating uh, documents available. They supplement court records and offer a, a window into lived experience which we would simply not otherwise have. And there's always the thrill of finding 
a new such narrative when I found the um, the narrative of James James Pump Barrett in the National Library of Australia. I almost stood up and cheered. Um, it was just in this obscure book of religiously themed stories. Um, a couple of the other stories are about fairs and avoiding um, other such irreligious places. So, but as more and more of these documents are found and used in conjunction with the official records and convict lives are pieced together, the, the elusive convict voice can, I hope, be heard ever louder. And I'll uh, cease there as I think I've gone on long enough, but thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you.